Selby, Canada Nickel Company, uh, advancing the Crawford Nickel Project towards a construction decision this year and publishing an additional six resources for a total of nine resources, uh, unlocking the Timmins Nickel District, uh, which we, has the potential to be the world's largest nickel sulfide district. Mike. Matt. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. <laughs> Back yard. Yes, welcome to sunny Toronto. Sunny free. Minus Toronto. 18. Last night, yep. Horrible. Here we go. Working towards FID and, and, and delivering FEED today. Um, fantastic news. Yeah, so we, we published the results of our front-end engineering uh, design. So what that what that is, because a lot of projects don't always get to that stage. Yeah. Um, so feasibility study takes the engineering uh to about 10%, and that's enough to come up with an estimate, you know, with a kind of error bar that's around there. What you do in the front end engineering design stage is you advance the engineering on a number of fronts so that to about 30% in total, um, so that you're in a position to be able to place orders for long lead items. Because, you know, in, t in today's world, a lot of times, you know, you need to, to, to look at placing some of those orders yeah. before you make get final investment decision, given that, you know, given the time frames available for right. certain and, pieces and of kit. A lot of kit. Yeah. In your case. Yes. The, the, the other thing is, obviously, it brings more certainty around the, the numbers that you previously provided. It's always about advancing that kind of certainty. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because you've got to kind of put that package together. And we've talked about that a few times. So um, where have you got to on that? Oh, yeah. So, you know, super happy with where things landed. You know, NPV up, IRR up. You know, the capital cost did go up 5%. Um, right. But, you know, the estimate for the feasibility, the sort of cost basis date for the feasibility study was December 2022. Right. You know, and we have seen a huge amount of inflation across a number of items. And yeah. so, you know, kudos to the team put it together, you know, that we did see some big increases on some items. Again, just the price price of a truck just went up, right? There's right. nothing we can do about it. But um, we, you know, one of the key components of, of, of this of this uh, update was we switched the mine plan to go with the east zone first versus the main zone. Right. Um, and that reduced the amount of stripping, which reduced the amount of trucks. And so, yeah, so we came up with some pretty clever ways to, to, to offset a bunch of those capital costs. And what's the difference that make the, oh, say, the, the clues of one of the words, the engineering, right? Yeah. So engineers are involved with this, but yeah. it was that bill so you kind of flip and move things around, but they still got the flexibility now and moving forward, have they? Oh, 100%. I mean, the, the thing with, you know, again, we've gone from fifth drill hole, uh, you know, to, through to feasibility study uh, when it came out was just over four years. You know, yeah. today we're just over five years. A lot of projects, um, yeah, and we skip from scoping study to, to feasibility study. Most projects have a pre-feasibility study in there, and most projects would have taken seven to ten years at least to get to the yeah. same point that we are. So at that point, you've you know you've you've had the resources defined for a while. You've kind of you know optimized them um, and so forth. You know, the part of the reason we've been able to go as quickly as we have is we've done things in parallel, yeah. and so we're not we don't wait for one stage to end necessarily before we start the yeah. next stage. And so. Um, Again, most of the times it, it's helpful, but you know sometimes, and this was an opportunity here, is as we were going through the feasibility study, we realized you know we had started drilling with the project and the resources on the main zone, and then the east zone sort of followed behind. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we as we you know continue to push ahead on the east zone, we realized oh you know this is actually a higher value ore body, so it doesn't make right. sense for it to go second. It needs to be first, and so we had the time during we didn't have the time during the, the feasibility study phase to do it, but we did have the time during the front end engineering design so as we were affirming up the capital cost we you know we did this we did this flip right okay like firming up the capital cost but also um, looking at that, that financing stack yep. as it were um does this allow other types of money to come in here because you're providing a different level of uh again come back to that word certainty in, in a market like this where few companies get to this point mm -hmm. and, and and those that do you know can fall over what 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 does this do for conversations for you Oh, it's, it's super helpful both on the debt and the equity front, right? So um, on the debt side, the next stage, we got those letter of intents back in the fall, 500 million US dollars from Export mm. Development Canada, 500 million Canadian from another financing institution. You know, the next stage in that process, you know, they, they've done some amount of due diligence. They just don't fire out press releases yeah. without doing, doing enough work. So they yeah. feel confident uh, to be able to, to go down that path. The next stage is, you know, we've we agreed on who an independent engineer in who basically goes through our engineering work and says, yep, no, it holds yeah. together. We like this project. Right. You know, um, you know, nego please negotiate final financing terms. So having that much more engineering complete, you know, should should make that independent engineering process that much easier. And the, I guess the other bit of this is we talked about the other day on I think it was the uh, Bashi show. Yeah. Um, with regard to the, the kind of influence of other kind of sovereign nations, sovereign yeah. states trying to get into this green economy yep. um 
Um, and in the context and backdrop of what we're seeing in Indonesia, which I'll, I'd like to talk to, you, to talk to you at the end here, like the Middle East is starting to have a bit of a say in projects like this. They want to have a say for sure, don't they? Yeah, no, I would say, you know, right now, you know, we're probably having as many or more conversation with Middle Eastern entities as we are with Korean entities, you know, in, in, in the battery supply chain. Yeah. You know, each one, you know, this, you know, the kingdoms, Saudi Arabia, each of the Emirates, you know, they've all made decisions that, you know, we need to start transitioning our economies away from oil, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, they've got huge, <laughs> each have huge sovereign wealth funds and then a bunch of sub sub funds that are funded by these huge sovereign wealth funds. And they are looking for ways to reposition their economy. And so projects like ours, which would be the you know Western world's largest nickel sulfide operation, we're talking about doing downstream nickel processing. We're talking about doing downstream stainless steel and alloy steel processing. Those are kind of the chunky businesses that they want to get involved in. And so, yeah, we know we're having, you know, <laughs> really, really good um, discussions with with groups there, um, you know that that are yeah. that are keen by the, the the various industrial opportunities that that you know our project can provide, and then the fact that you know we've got an entire district where we think there's going to be multiple projects, you know, because for them five or ten billion dollars for a project, you know, yeah. is just kind of you know is 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 not a big deal. You know, they so a lot of their yeah, projects no. are even you know tens of billions of dollars. So. Absolutely, as I said, coming out of the oil space is obviously dwarfs mining. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so is, yes, but I can I also um, can validate that in the sense that when when I was working, over, they, they wanted like the biggest and the biggest, yeah, or the tallest or the best, or yeah. they, you know what I mean. It, it was not a, just an also ran project, which I think yours delivers against that, yeah, for sure. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah, no, it's been, it's been, you know, we've really started to engage, you know, big time, and the it, towards you know the the end of the year last year, and it, you know followed up in January, and I continue to have multiple discussions with multiple groups in yeah. multiple Emirates, so you know, that's going very very well. Okay, cool. Um, well, what are, what are they? Um, how are they reading the situation? Because the, the, I guess there's two things going on here. One, you say, Rick, everyone's saying, well, uh, Indonesia will kind of flood the market, Indonesia will define the market, et cetera. And then there's the, well, that, that's one side of the equation. The other is, if we allocate capital to a big enough resource, well, actually, we might just have a say about what the future could hold to. So the, the, does, does the money change everything? Well, the, mon- the money does, right? I mean, again, they're, I mean, in, in many ways, they're very similar to the Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, where, you know, they have a much longer, you know, this isn't a seven-year North American private equity fund that's got to find a way to exit within the seven-year fund window. No, these guys, you know, are willing to invest and play for the long term, you know, and so, you know, yeah, large-scale resources that are on the right part of the cost curve, you know, are the kind of things that they want to do. And then critical minerals, you know, they're they're smart enough to see that, you know, in in today's world and and with Trump, the you know, the last forty five days, um, you know, the whole China versus the West conflict is 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 not going to you know get all get resolved, you know, in the next week or so. So if they can help enable um, you know production of critical minerals in the West and and have Saudi and the Emirates be part of that transition mm-hmm. to help you know uh, you know wean. Uh, the West off of Chinese supplied uh, critical minerals. They're they're very glad and very excited by the opportunity to do so. so. Right. And, and what is happening in Indonesia at the moment? I mean, obviously, the price has been erratic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been bouncing. You know, the last three or four months on the battery show, we were talking about the fact that nickel has been sort of bouncing yeah. between fifteen thousand and fifteen thousand eight hundred dollars a ton, which is either side of seven dollars a pound for people who do it per pound. Yeah. But the one thing that I pointed to on the show, right, is the Indonesian ore price. You know, that's going to be the biggest indicator in terms of, you know, you know, what's that supply demand balance? Mm. What are the Indonesians going to do in terms of managing supply? And so, you know, it's been great since Chinese New Year. We've seen the, you know, the price of ore in Indonesia tick up about a dollar a ton, which is about two to two and a half percent per week. Right. So we'll, we'll see how that continues through. You know, that's last year what drove the nickel price to go from 15 up to 21,000 uh, last spring. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens there. You know, there's a, a you know, the, the other part that we've talked about on the battery show is, you know, the, you know, the fundamental reason why Indonesia, you know, should look at pushing nickel prices a little bit higher than lower is the big run up in nickel and stainless steel production from 2015 to the early 2020s, you know, pushed them to 20 in 2022, having a current account surplus, yeah. having a, a big trade surplus. Yeah. And with the come down in prices, They've actually slipped back into a trade deficit, current account deficit, and just just at the end of end, end of last week, the government announced you know currency controls in terms of 
you know, worried about, you know, managing the currency because again, you know, the currency was going in the right direction when you have a current account surplus. Mm -hmm. Now that you're back into deficit, you know, you're going back into the old trend, you know, that continued to see, you know, the rupiah, you know, drop, you know, year in, year out. And so in the Indonesian government's, you know, taking some pretty extraordinary steps to try and manage that. So, or they could just raise the nickel price. So the rest of that. Yes. It's quite a simple mechanism. Yes. Yes. Which they're in control of. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and sorry, and just want to, I'm sorry, I don't want to become a battery show conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Just stick with you. Yeah. It's, it's all about me. Yeah. Um, you put out, you've also put out an announcement around some sort of First Nations issues, which is kind of sort of t timely in the sense that, you know, when we last spoke, we were talking about me having to go through a process with regard to funding yep. with, with another group. Yep. Uh, does this sort of say, like, you know, we do have the support and we do have the ear of everyone we need to for, for the social license side of this conversation? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, we're, we're really, ex you know, Again, we've talked about the broad support we have from the local communities and local First Nations communities. But, you know, again, it's great when communities step up in a way to really put their money where their mouth is. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we're still the TTN deal. You know, yeah. TTN's working uh, to get to get, get through a few administrative issues uh, to be able to close on the convertible yeah. note. Um, but then today's announcement around, you know, some really chunky, um, you know, construction projects mm. um, as part of the overall project that will be delivered by um, at the, you know, uh, these communities negotiate through a vehicle called Wabin, um, sort of as, as, a, as a business group. And so Metagami, Metachuan, Flying Post, um, you know, they're the other, you know, core communities, mm. you know, that we work with in the area. And, and again, you know, in advance of completing the IBA, we're working towards that, you know, to be able, you know, for them to step up and say, yeah, no, we want to deliver these parts of the project for you. Yeah. Again, as a great endorsement of the project, great endorsement of what we're doing, you know, and we've got a, you know, great relationship with Jason Batiste and the team at, team at WAB and then and yeah. local community chiefs. So, you know, we're going to have a big, big, uh, uh, press announcement later today and, and looking forward okay. to, to, to uh, 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 having that. Yeah. 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 Oh, awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's great. Big, big contingency. Down yes. Yeah. Timmons. Yeah. Done, yep. well done. Um, right, it's in, in terms of like 2025, right? Because yep. we've we, I mean, been through an accelerated process to yep. get to where you are today. And the feed uh, announcement is, is a big deal. Yeah. What do we what do we see from you in 2025 in terms of maybe get, getting this thing moving to a point where people can appreciate and maybe even start to value this thing differently? Yeah. Well, that, that's the part is, you know, we're really, you know, so there's three main thrusts. One is Crawford, right, getting that to, to a construction decision before year end. Two, there's, you know, we've talked about the potential the Timmins Nickel District. You know, this year it's about, you know, publishing another six resources. So we have nine in the district this in year? total. Yes, yeah, wow. but by mid-year. Wow. Um, and then pushing the downstream business along, getting the feasibility yeah. study complete. You know, so we've got the downstream plants ready to go uh, to, to link up with Crawford. You know, in terms of, of getting Crawford, uh, you know, to that, um, you know, in, investment decision is basically permitting and a little bit of engineering. Um, you know, we're working to get the full funding package together with Scotia and Deutsche Bank by year end. Yeah. Uh, you know, as I talked about earlier, you know, we're working with Cutfield Freeman to get to those next stages in terms of, the, of the, getting the debt package uh, together, um, you know, in terms of permitting. Uh, we, we we're now in the final approval stage. Um, with the federal government, you know, yeah. and we remain on track, you know, to be able to get those approvals uh, by year end, and we'll be sequencing the, the provincial permits, you know, in, in line um, with that. And so, you know, the great thing about having sort of a portfolio of assets that we do is, you know, it gives us a lot of opportunities to look at non-equity ways of yeah. getting the remaining capital that we need to do it. So in terms of, you know, different royalties and so forth. Um, so again, there should be some announcements, you know, in the next next month or so uh, on that front, you know, which will, will keep us well funded without, you know, having to do much at the equity level, which is great. Um, on, on the exploration side, yeah, we, we did all that drilling funded by Agnico Eagle yeah. um, last year um, with the charity flow through deal that they backed. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll have six, six resources. So Crawford, we've published two of the regional properties. We've got six more to go. And, yeah. and by that point, you know, we expect that the, you know, the total nickel resource there you know, will be larger than the total endowment um, at Sudbury, which was wow. you know, the, the, the world's largest nickel sulfide district up to this point. And we're still just scratching the surface. Yeah, I mean, okay. there's a lot. <laughs> Look at yeah. this year. Just, just, just like, again, let's make a little first things first, right? Okay. With, with things like um, Scotia and Deutsche, yeah. um, the, 
they're going to want you to have certain things in place before they can really kind of get into the meat of what they do. You know, I, I sat on that side of the table before. The permanent, permanent is clearly a big, big part of that. Yeah. But what, what are the kind of, and maybe in priority order, the things which say to them, like, okay, we've now got enough to be able to do what we need to do and, and close this thing, get this over. Oh, the yeah. I mean, post-feasibility study was, was enough. You know, the challenge was with the, you know, the, the uncertainty around the electric vehicle market, the uncertainty yeah. around the election, the U.S. election outcomes. Right. Again, things have not settled down per se post-Trump, right. but we know we have a winner, you know, and, and the world is going to operate with it within okay. a range. Um, you know, we, we're now at, at this feed, you know, completion of the feed study. And yeah. again, it just made sense to, rather than getting people to do a pile of work on a mine plan that we weren't actually going to, yeah. to execute. Yeah. It just made sense to wait until that, that happens. And so, you know, with this feed study done, um, uh, you know, with the permits, you know, clearly um, in this in this final phase and on the way this fall, you know, we've got all the ingredients in, in place to push forward. And again, we've got a number of, of Mideast groups that are super keen <laughs> to get into yeah. it. We've got the groups from Korea that now the election's over with. EVs are still growing at 25 percent a okay. year. You okay. know, they're keen to get low carbon. Uh, clean nickel that they can you know sell into into Western markets, um, and then you know we've got we've had a number of government agencies, whether it's France, Germany, the U.S., you know, come up with other critical fund critical minerals funding programs, you know, that can help provide the equity side of the equation. So Scotia and Deutsche Bank will be working to sort of shepherd those okay. together in a package, you know, but before you. So everything's going to come together for them in the last sort of you know, you know four or five months. Yeah. Terms of getting some of those things. Out of the out of the way, and of course you've obviously loaded up the kind of carbon capture component yep. in there in there too. So it, looking good. So but the the, mar the the main market for your product, it can be EV. It's good enough for that, but still is obviously we're maintaining the key part of the downstream business is to produce a product that 100% can go to the EV market, right? And 100% can go into the stainless steel so and alloy market. That so we're yeah 100% optionality, right? And again, you know, there are people you know, tariff seems to be a word that we hear quite often in Canada, um, in Canada particularly. <laughs> um, you know, the key thing yeah. for us is the U.S. and Europe are both net importers of of nickel, yeah, and so. You know, we're in great shape um, on that front. Our product can go to either. Again, it makes more sense for it to go to U U.S., but yeah. if it has to get sold into Europe, you know, we're fine yeah. to do that. Yeah. And then in terms of the stainless and alloy steel product, you know, having a low carbon product that we expect to produce, you know, is Europe's the place that actually, you know, really pays up for it. So, um, you know, we're, we're in good shape on that front, too. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. Okay. Enjoy the rest of the week and maybe catch you before we shuffle back to uh, Bl old Blighty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Sounds good.